So we take our Bibles then tonight and go to Ephesians chapter 1, please. Ephesians chapter 1. And thinking of the la- that last verse in that hymn tonight, you know. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in the clouds in the sky. What a wonderful experience that's going to be. And of course, in our studies now on Sunday morning, we have been considering uh, Israel and current events and really what God's got in plan for the nation of Israel. And when you look at what's going on in Israel today, there was a, there was a little phrase that the, uh, the Temple Institute uh, <clears throat> uh, used, and it's this, uh, you build it and he'll come. You know, you used to use that, you know, you build it and they'll come, but... Um, if Israel builds it, he'll come, and he won't come before it's built, because again, those scriptures are there. Um, but there's, there was some debate among the Jews, you know, they, they say, well, we shouldn't build it, the Messiah should build it. Of course, the Messiah will build it. And that uh, temple of Ezekiel chapter 40 and following is the one that Jesus builds, and Zechariah chapter 2, I think, speaks of that as well, um, chapter 4. But, um, uh, but they will build one. And it's just an amazing thing. If you research that and go online, and there's so many things on the website that are looking at what's going to take place and what they're already doing. It's just an amazing thing. And uh, surely uh, the times are drawing nigh. Well, in Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read tonight verse 13 and 14. Um, <clears throat> and this is the last in the section concerning the blessings from the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, in fact, let's just read from verse, uh, from verse 1 through verse 14. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace." wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he may gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. And Father, we pray that you'll bless the reading of your word tonight, Help our hearts to be set. Oh, Lord, thank you for the sense of your presence with us. We're grateful, Lord, for all the blessings that you have given to us. And, Lord, may we be patient enough tonight to sit and to learn a wee bit more about what you've already done in the person of the Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, that you'll guide us. And, Lord, we pray that you'll comfort. We pray that you will um, uh, strengthen uh, the faith of these ones who believe upon you. And, Lord, the assurance that you bring uh, may each of us partake, uh, partake of that and, and understand and have that as our present possession tonight, that sure assurance that we are his and he is ours. We ask, Lord, now you bless us and help us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Paul is speaking to those in a very prestigious city, the city of Ephesus, a very prestigious city of the Roman Empire, revealing really what true prestige, true wealth, true possession really is. And we see, we've seen already in this chapter, the blessings of the Father, verses 3 to 6, the blessings of the Son, verse 7 to verse 12, and the blessings of the Holy Spirit, verse 13 to verse 14. Now you might say, Tom, why do you keep repeating all of that? All right, because I, sometimes I'll say in a message the same thing over and over again, because I don't want you to shut that out. It's repetition is, is how you learn stuff. 
And uh, you should have that already marked in your Bible. And so as I'm going through here, you say, yep, that's right, Tom. That's what you said last time. And, and uh, after a while, uh, when somebody says, what is the, first, what is the first, ver- first chapter of Ephesians talk about? Immediately the Trinity will come to you. It's about blessings, blessings from the Father, blessings from the Son, blessings from the Holy Spirit. And then it ends with Paul's prayer for them that they would understand all of those blessings. And so, and really, you know, um, I, I guess it would be pretty good students if you could just name a chapter in the Bible and you could immediately know what it says. But certainly in the New Testament, especially these kind of books, uh, we should know what those, what those chapters involve really right off the top of our head. And that's the way we do it. And so verse 15 to verse 23 through the end of the chapter deals with the prayer for their understanding. Now, what this is really all about in these, in these first verses of chapter 1 is it's, it's really about explaining our salvation, explaining what happened to us when we got saved. It's the blessings that God has blessed us with, and all those blessings are found in Him, in Christ. Well, that's, that's speaking about our salvation. When we believed upon Christ, we were placed in Him. And all these things, even the election and the predestination, they're not the causes of salvation. They're the results of salvation. They're the blessings of salvation. And when we understand it that way, it won't scare you. It won't frighten you away from it. It's something to be received, something that will be a blessing to you. So we're going to look at three points again tonight. First of all, uh, we see the salvation of God in verse 13. Notice verse 13 again. In fact, look at verse 12. He says that, that we... And he's speaking about, I guess, the Jews, or certainly that generation before the, the, the Ephesian believers, that we should be the, to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also. And you notice the word ye there, that's plural. He's speaking to them as a group. And it could be that he's, a, that he's speaking to them primarily as the Gentiles because the first generation to get saved were Jews, and now the Gentiles have received Christ in whom ye also, also as well as the Jews, have trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. He's speaking about salvation, the gospel of your salvation. Now, the word, the word gospel mean, means, of course, good news. And that's what salvation is. Salvation is brilliant news. It is the, most, it's the best news in all the world. That we can be reconciled to God, that we can be brought into the right relationship with our Creator, that we're going to go to heaven when we die. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And, and don't, don't muddy that up. There is a message that says that you can know for sure that heaven is yours. You can know for sure that you are redeemed, that you are reconciled, that you are right with God. You can know it for sure, not based upon your works or your merits, but because of your position in Jesus Christ. And he says that we are saved. We noticed this last time, um, because God hath, then we have. We have certain things presently because God has done some things for us. And of course, in chapter 2, he speaks about this. He goes as far as time. He starts out what we were before we got saved, and then here's what God did, and here's, now, here's what we are after we got saved. Look at chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace, ye are saved. Look at those last two words. You are saved. Are saved. Not hope to be saved. Not were saved. You were and you are and you will always be saved. When you're saved by grace, this is the present standing that we have. It's the possession that we possess. Look at verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. For by grace are ye saved. Your standing is that of salvation. This is the gospel. It is good news. And because we are saved, all these wonderful things that he's been talking about are true of you. You are chosen. Uh, You are predestinated to stand before God unblameable. You are accepted, not because of what you've done. You're accepted because you're in him. You're accepted in the beloved. You are redeemed. You are forgiven. You have been given understanding of his will you do right now possess the inheritance which is something we possess now and uh, it's a little glimpse of what's coming but the best is yet to come in other words you have a future you have an inheritance with God this is your salvation notice again verse 13 he says the gospel of your salvation this is something that is personal it's something that you possess and it's something he delights and explaining to these believers. Now, why does he need to explain all these things? You know, <clears throat> most people, when they get saved, don't understand all this stuff. I didn't. 
In fact, when I first got saved, I didn't really know that it was, I guess I never really thought about it. It wasn't explained to me until later on, a few weeks later on, that once you get saved, you're always saved. I didn't know that. It never really occurred to me. I was just so excited about being saved, you know, and all those questions really hadn't hit me yet. Um, but he needs to explain these things as we need to uh, understand what happened to us when we got saved. Now, we, he goes on to talk about the salvation. The salvation of God is something that comes through trust or belief. And I think these, these verses are so important. He's speaking about salvation, and at this point, he's explained to us how we got it. He's reminding us how we got it. And in verse 12, he says, who first trusted in Christ. That's how you get saved. You get saved by trusting in Christ. He says the same thing in verse 13. He says, in whom you also trusted. After that, you heard uh, the word of truth, the gospel of, our, of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Now, belief and trust is the same thing. Again, salvation that comes uh, through faith, it's not an intellectual faith, it's a heart faith. It's a, it's a belief that is expressed in the sense that we are trusting him. We're taking our soul and placing it in his hands. We're trusting him that he will keep his word, his promise, that he indeed will, will save us. And so this is a matter of the heart. And obviously it involves the mind too because we must hear the word of truth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by, by the word of God. So there's a message we've got to hear, we've got to understand, our mind kicks in. Uh, but that won't save us. Just understanding the gospel won't save you. It's trusting the gospel. It's trusting Christ. It's trusting what it says. Uh, it is faith that saves you. It is the heart that believes unto righteousness. It is the heart, heart belief and trust that saves. Now I understand that to mean and this is important because in these verses when he explains this, he doesn't talk about anything else. He doesn't talk about baptism. He doesn't talk about faithfulness. He doesn't talk about um, you know, membership in the church. And there, there are other things involved. For example, the Bible, and we talked about it at length this morning, about repentance. But he doesn't mention repentance. The Bible also talks about confession in Romans chapter 10. But here he doesn't mention confession. Now why is that? Because I believe that Repentance and confession and faith, if you like, are, um, are, are one and the same. If a person truly believes, then repentance is something that comes with that. He doesn't mention it here, but he doesn't have to mention it here. Um, because if a person truly believes, what is, you know, repentance is, it's a, it's a change. It's a change of your mind. It's a change of direction. It's a decision that is made. You're going this way. You stop. You turn around. And that happens because we believe. And also confession, confession means to agree with. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that's speaking to big Christians, but Christians have to own up. Christians have to say, God, you're right and I'm wrong um, about my sin. Lord, I confess my sin that I'm wrong in this and I'm wrong in this. Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. And so confessing God is agreeing with who he is. Now, I want you to go to Acts chapter 10 for just a moment because this is important. And here's the reason why it's important. We get a little paper through the, the mailbox. Um, I forget what it's called, Hearts and Homes or something. It's for, from the Church of Christ. Anybody ever get that? It's a little magazine that comes from the Church of Christ. Everybody in Smithville gets it, some of you down here. And usually in, in their little magazine, they have a list of things. And so the list goes like something like this. Maybe I should have brought one in, but it goes something like this. Repent, believe, confess, get baptized, be faithful, endure, serve, or something like that. And so they've got this list, and this is, what, this is their way to salvation. This is how they promote it. This is how you get saved. Repent, believe, confess, baptism, faithfulness, and they've got their list. But, you know, salvation is not in a list. And he doesn't give you a list there. And when you come to chapter 10 of Acts, there's a man by the name of Cornelius. And when Cornelius gets saved, there's no list. And it doesn't mention... In fact, it doesn't even mention faith, to be honest with you. Uh, look at Acts chapter 10. Now, <clears throat> Cornelius was a devout man. He was a, a Jewish proselyte. He was uh, one who prayed to God to give alms. And he was truly in his heart seeking light. And of course, the principle is when you seek light, God will give you more light. But there's a point where you, you must come in order to be saved. We talked about this today. The Jews... As much as we love them, as much as we pray for Israel, they are lost. Because Paul sa or Peter said in Acts 4, verse, uh, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other. 
For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You must be saved. And Christ is the only Savior. And anyone uh, to have his sins forgiven to be redeemed must be in Jesus Christ. And so he says, send for Peter. The angel appears to Cornelius. He send, send man to, man to Joppa and uh, find Peter. And Peter will tell you what you need to do to be saved. And so Peter comes. And uh, in, in Acts chapter 10, we have his sermon. Um, look at verse 38. Peter speaks, And how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these of, of all things which he did, both in the land of Ju the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on the tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly. Now, in verse 39, verse 40, you just, you just heard the gospel there. Jesus died, was buried, and he rose again. Verse 40, God raised him from the on the third, up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but on the witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead and to, uh, to give him, or sorry, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him, shall receive remission of sins. I, I told you a lie. It does mention faith, doesn't it? Well, what, what I meant by that was it doesn't talk about Cornelius's faith or Cornelius's repentance or Cornelius's confession because in verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Now, what verse 44 is telling you is this whole crowd got saved. When Peter was preaching... And they were so eager, their hearts were so open for the truth. They were so wanting to say yes and believe what was, they were believing everything was coming. And so when they heard the gospel that Christ died for their sins, and as Peter explained that, and rose from the dead, Cornelius and his whole house were believing it in that moment. And so they got saved right in the middle of the preaching. Peter never got even finished in his, his sermon. He never got to the invitation. I don't know if they do invitations, but... He never got to it because this man and those with him believed. And in that moment, they trusted him. Now, it doesn't say anything about his repentance and so on, uh, but I believe that he did repent. And I believe that he did confess. It might not have been to others, although he did speak with tongues, talking about the wonderful works of God, but I think at the moment, that was, in a sense, the result of his, of his salvation because um, a man... Uh, the only way a man could receive, receive the Holy Spirit had to be saved, you see. But I believe he agreed with what was being preached. I believe he believed it in his heart. I believe he changed his mind. I believe he accepted what was being said. It's a matter of the heart. Listen, salvation is, is simple. It's a simple thing. God wants you to trust Christ. Now, a man who's not repentant, he's, uh, you know, there's ulterior motives why people will pray a prayer and join the church and all the rest of it. Um, but a man who's truly serious as one who's seeking, has already decided, I'm on the wrong path, and he's already changed, he's already turned. And so these are matters of the heart. Repentance and faith and confession to God was a matter of the heart with these men. And also there was a willingness, you see. In verse 45, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hey, this has never happened before. You, 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 these Gentiles are getting saved Without coming through the Judaism, yeah. And that's how you and I got seen. And really, you know, the whole book of Acts is a transition, but if, if there was anywhere you want to land on a transition, that would have, this would have been it right here. And so, in verse 46, for they heard them speak with uh, tongues and magnify. By the way, that's why tongues were given, to convince the unconvinced Jew. And the unconvinced Jews here were actually saved people. But they had to be convinced that the Gentiles were saved by grace through faith. And Peter, as Peter recounts that story in chapter 11, he tells them that. In fact, uh, if you look over at verse 15, he's recounting this story. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them. This is chapter 11, verse 15. As on us at the beginning, then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he had said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? And when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Interesting, he puts repentance in there. But it doesn't mention repentance, it mentions faith, you see. 
Faith is the thing. That's how you get saved. You get saved by grace through faith. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And friend, this is not just shooting in the dark here. You go all through the whole section on justification in the book of Romans, and that's what he talks about. We are saved by grace through faith. That's what Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The whole treatise on justification, it doesn't even mention those other things. It is true faith. That's what saves. But true faith will have repentance in there. It will have confession in there. And it will have a willingness because, look down here, verse 47. Uh, Peter says, uh, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? All right, now that's the Campbellites have a real hard time with that. The Church of Christ has a real hard time with that because there's no way that you can say that these people were not saved because they had the Holy Spirit. Only saved people have the Holy Spirit and they weren't baptized yet. But there was a willingness to them. And truly, I believe when somebody gets saved, and this is some sort of real issue in their past or something, when somebody gets saved, there is repentance, there is faith, there is confession in their heart, and there's certainly a willingness to get baptized. There's, there's a softness there. There's a new creature that is created on the inside. But how does it all happen? It happens when we trust Jesus Christ. And that's important because people come and they say, well, have I repented enough? Have I repented hard enough? Have I believed? Do I believe enough? Have I confessed enough? And their whole philosophy is wrong. Forget about all that. You come and you trust Christ. And when you trust Christ... That's, that's the key that unlocks everything. So we see the salvation of God. It's not a matter of having a list. It's just trust him. Secondly, we see the sequence of events. Go back, please, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1. And the interesting thing that we notice here, if we read it carefully, and um, I, I love Bible study. Solomon said in much study that it's a weariness to the flesh, you know. Um, and it is in some ways. And sometimes I drag myself into my study. And it's like, you remember when you're in school and you're trying to do math? Now, once you got into doing math and you were doing it, you know, for 30 minutes or so, not that I was any good at it, but after about 30 minutes, you sort of get into the way of it and you were thinking that way and, and other things would just, you know, wouldn't be able to distract you because your mind was on. Same thing with Bible study. Sometimes you've got to drag yourself to it, you know. But once you start into it, once you start unpacking things and, look and connecting dots and stuff, it's great. It's really fun. It really is. And um, studying the Bible is, is um, it's interesting. And what, when you study the Bible, you, you look for, you know, read the thing over and over. And look, for, look for, what is it saying? Look for things that are, uh, maybe that you're not normally thinking about. Um, and as you read this, basically what you see is there, there's sequence of events. In other words, before you got saved, the work of the Father has been accomplished. Uh, in other words, before we got saved, um, God the Father, he... Uh, chose certain things for us. Um, for those who would trust the Son, this is going to, what's going to happen to you. You'll be chosen. You'll be predestinated. You'll um, have an inheritance, and all these things are true. Um, and then Christ, of course, he died for us to provide that salvation. And so uh, all that was done before we got saved. But the work of the Holy Spirit, now there is a work of the Holy Spirit that happens before we get saved in that he he convicts you. He's in the world to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's there to woo you and to point you to Christ. And he certainly works in your heart. Um, but, uh, but really, the, the actual work of the Holy Spirit happens in your life after you get saved. There's actually a sequence of events. And now notice, please, in verse, um, look at verse 13 again. He said, in whom ye also trusted. Now notice the next word, after. After. In other words, you trusted Christ, but some things happened before you trusted Christ. You trusted Christ after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believe. Now, there's not a long period of time. It's not that you believe and then there's a long period of time and then you receive the Holy Spirit. If you look at the original context and the words and so on, um, it's, it's basically at, at that point when you believe. But you believe first, and then as a result of that faith, then the Holy Spirit does something. He says, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Notice those two words, after. 
Okay? So you heard the gospel. By the way, Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? So there's a sequence of events that takes place one after the other. And so it is here uh, in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. After that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. <clears throat> now this is something the Holy Spirit does for you. The Father's already done some things. The Son has already done some things. You have to do some things. Your part is to trust. Your part, my part is to believe. And then when we do that, then the Holy Spirit comes out. It's almost like we're sandwiched, you know. The Lord has worked and the Lord will work and we're, in the, we're the meat in the middle. We make that decision that really brings all those things together home uh, to us. So what he says there in verse 13, he says, In whom also after that ye believed, ye, notice the, ye, the word ye is again, it's plural, speaking to the group, ye were, past tense, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, why did he need to tell them that? Because, you know, a lot of Pentecostal churches believe that, okay, they'll, they'll say this, have you, have you received the Holy Ghost since you've believed? And uh, we'll talk about that maybe a little bit in, in a little bit. But that's a question that Paul asked the believers in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, who were the disciples of John the Baptist. Now, why did he ask that? Because that's not a legitimate question for today. Understand that that's a transitional period of time. You had Old Testament believers, okay? I believe that they were saved under John's ministry and uh, that they hadn't actually even heard the, the, the New Testament message of the gospel yet. Uh, and whatever you, whatever you believe about that, it was a transition period of time. That was not a legitimate question for us today. You can't go to a Christian and say, you know, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? But some churches will teach that. And, and they'll convince you because you haven't had this sort of experience that they'll sit you down here and put their hands on you and pray that you'll receive the Holy Ghost. And then they're looking for evidence of that receiving the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues and so on. Well, why then did Paul need to tell them what happened to them? He said, after that you believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Why did he need to tell them that? Because receiving the Holy Spirit is not an experience. He said, well, you just read Cornelius and he spoke in tongues. Yeah, because he had to convince the Jews that the Gentiles... You see, speaking in tongues was a sign. God was helping people to understand that he was doing something different. There's a transition, changing gears. Now the Gentiles are getting saved without becoming Jews first. That never happened before. God's going to put a mark on them. And so some of the gifts were there as sign gifts to convince people of what God was doing. That's not true today. And so he needed to tell them that so that they would understand the blessings that they have in God because being sealed with the Holy Spirit is not an experience. It is a fact that takes place when you believe. The moment you believe, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit promise. And it's not something you feel. It's not something you're you know, going to experience. It's not, it's not going to be some uh, ecstatic experience or speaking in tongues or anything like that. They, weren't, they didn't have any of that. He had to tell them what happened to them, explain what happened to them. Now, the, the, um, and by the way, he said all of them. And, and you find this, and we're going to look at some, in fact, let's just go to our, our last point. The first point was we see the salvation of God. The second thing is we see the sequence of events. The last thing uh, we want to look at is we see the sealing of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be sealed with the Holy Spirit? Well, first, there's three things here. First of all, it means to be indwelled by God. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to do a little Bible study here. We're going to show you some verses. And you might want to underline these verses. Now, we've done this before. This was one of the first Bible studies I did as a Christian because my mom and daddy were Pentecostals. And they were telling me, you know, you need the second blessing. You need to receive the Holy Ghost. And my preacher was telling me, you've already got the Holy Ghost. So my mom and daddy is telling me one thing and the preacher is telling me another thing. That's, that's what you call being ripped apart, <laughs> being torn as a new Christian when he saved a couple of weeks. So what did I do? I had to get my Bible out. And I, I read through the whole New Testament looking for this one doctrine. Do I have the Holy Spirit? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 12, it says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now he's speaking to one of the most carnal churches in the New Testament, probably 
obviously the most carnal church. He says, I couldn't speak to you on the spiritual, but it's on the babes in Christ, carnal. Here, here were Christians who were burly Christians, if you like. They were carnal. They were in the flesh. Um, and yet Paul relates to them as a group, and he says, now we have received not the Spirit, and he's not just speaking about him, he's relaying this to them as well, that they're involved in this. We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that ye might know the things that are freely given to us of God. So right there, he tells us that we have the Holy Spirit. Look at chapter 3 and verse 16, just down the page. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Do you see that? Um, he says, your body is the temple. It's the house of God. God lives inside of you. And he's speaking now to carnal Christians, again verifying the fact that we already have the Holy Spirit. Look at chapter 6 and verse 19. And by the way, he's speaking to them as a group. He didn't come in and say, well, some of you have the Holy Spirit and some of you still haven't had the second blessing yet. No, he just talked to all of them. He says, listen, guys, it's a fact. It's done deal. You all have the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that? All of you, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives inside you. Do you not know that? And uh, chapter 6 and verse 19, he says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. comes with a package. The redemption package is part of your salvation. Look over at chapter, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The sealing of the Holy Spirit is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into you. Again, it's not an experience to be sought. It's a fact to be understood and accepted. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21, he says, Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us. Well, that's another, that's another way of saying the same thing. Anointing, and John says in 1 John that we have received the, anoint, the anointing of God. All right, the anointing of God is the Holy Spirit coming into you. And uh, he says, uh, And hath, past tense, anointed us is God, verse 22, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Okay, so there again, it's a past tense. We have been anointed, we have been sealed, we have been given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Look, if you read at chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians in verse 16, and we're not going to give you all the verses because there's probably about three times more verses that I found, um, really starting from about Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. If any man have not the Spirit of God, he's none of his. In 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 16, he says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. So here they were. Touching the unclean thing. Here they were unseparated. He's telling them to get out, to come away from wickedness, to come away um, from uncleanness. And he says, why? Because you are the temple of God. What concord, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of God because he lives inside of you. Carnal Christians. They weren't the spiritual group. And so he says that you're the temple of God. Look over at Galatians chapter 3. And verse number two. Now this is an interesting question that he asks of the Galatians because he's, he's, he's tying these two questions together. Your salvation and your receiving the Holy Spirit happened at the same time. And how did you get saved? Same way, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Same way you got saved. How did you get saved? Same way you received the Holy Spirit. It's all the one thing and it happens by faith. Look at verse 2 of Galatians 3. He says, This only would I learn of you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? And he's basically saying, how did you get saved? You get saved by the hearing of the law? No, by faith. How did you receive the Holy Spirit? By the hearing of the law? No, by faith. Because the receiving of the Holy Spirit and believing upon Christ is exactly the same thing. Um, so the, the sealing of the Holy Spirit is the indwelling of God. Now just stop for a minute. One of the blessings of the Holy Spirit is that you have him. One of the things that he has done for us after we got saved is he came in to live inside of us. Our bodies are the temple of God. God lives in us. Uh, God wants us to commune with him. 
you know, there's a sense in which we sense the, the, uh, the presence of the Lord, maybe in a, in a service or maybe when you're on your knees in prayer. Um, but God is with us. But not only is he with us, he's in us. How do you know that? Because you feel it. Sometimes I feel it. Most times I don't feel it. Well, how do you know it? Because he tells me it. And believe in what God says. I know that just the way I know that I'm redeemed, I know that I'm forgiven, and the way that I know that I'm predestinated, the way I know I'm chosen, because God has told me in his word. That's why he wrote it. And that's why Paul wrote these things, so we would understand these things, to know what we have in God, in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. So the sealing of the Holy Spirit is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, it means to have the earnest from God. Look at verse 14 again. So he says, <clears throat> In him also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now the, the earnest is the down payment until the claiming of the purchased possession. Now this is, this is a little bit different because... Um, you know, I, and I use the illustration, you're going to go buy a car... And maybe you don't have the three thousand dollars or four thousand dollars in your pocket, so you go with three or four, maybe two hundred dollars or something. And you go with the guy. You see the car. I want the car. I want to buy the car. I'm going to go get the money. And he wants to know: Are you in earnest? Are you serious? Because if I don't give him any money, I could walk away and say, "You know something? I'm not really sure about that." Or on the way home, I see a better car and I buy it. And he's sitting here waiting. Some people, buyers are coming. I want to buy your car. And he said, "No, it's, it's a really, guys are really interested in it." How do you know he's interested in it? Well, I'll tell you why he's interested. Because he opened his wallet up and he put $200 in my palm, my palm of my hand. Now, that means the guy's really interested. He's not going to give me $200 and not come back. He's coming back for the car and he's coming back with the rest of the money. And so that's the earnest money. It means that you're serious. But there's a difference here. Because Christ didn't come and pay part of our fame. And walk away and say, well, I'm going to come back and pay the rest of the thing later on. You see, the earnest here is not really for the person who's receiving the money. In other words, the Father has been completely satisfied with the price that Jesus has made. And so this earnest is not to give the Father confidence. This earnest is to give you confidence, us confidence. And it's kind of like this. It's kind of like when, uh, when the servant of Abraham went to get a bride for Isaac. And he comes to Rebecca, and uh, he basically makes a proposal of marriage to Rebecca at the well. And uh, he starts pulling out these earrings, these golden earrings and these golden bangles and stuff. Now, in their culture, she knew exactly what that meant. And he gives those things to her. And that's an assurance that this is not a fly-by-night thing. This is a serious offer, proposal of marriage. I want to go back to your house. I want to talk to your daddy about this. Are you open for it? And she's agreeable. So she goes back. And uh, the servant of Abraham gives to Laban gifts as well to give assurance to him that this is a real deal. So Laban needs to have assurance. Um, uh, it was her brother, Bethuel. It was her daddy. The whole family got, uh, got stuff. And, uh, and Rebecca got stuff. Now, <clears throat> it's kind of like this. Rebecca could be the whole time that before she meets Isaac, and she's, her, her, her emotions are in a whirlwind. Here she's leaving her daddy's house to go to a complete stranger to be his wife. Never met him before. Where she's never going to go home again. She's going to live in his house for the rest of her life. That's a big step. But you know, and, and, you know, and the fear and doubt could, man, I could, what are you doing? Are you mad? And then she looks down at her hand and she sees these beautiful, golden, ornate bracelets. And she says, you know something? I don't know exactly what it's going to be over there, but when I look at this, I, I take the light in it now, but you know something? I know there's more where that came from. <laughs> and that's the thing that gave her assurance. Now, of course, that's an illustration, and it's an illustration of um, the, the proposal that the Holy Spirit makes to us. Will you have Jesus Christ to be your Savior? That's the question they asked, Laban asked his sister. He says, wilt thou go with this man? And, um, you know, he wanted to go. Hey, we've got to go. We gotta. And they said, well, we'll, we'll inquire at the damsel, see what she wants. And she, he said, wilt thou go with this man? Such short notice. And she says, I will go. And so the Holy Spirit comes to us. He says, we have Jesus Christ to be your Savior. And there's all kinds of maybe uncertainty about that. But somehow we said, yes. 
and we trust that Christ is our Savior and we realize we're going to go live in His house forever and we're not going to stay here and we're saying yes to a person we've never seen or heard before and there's a certain amount of people would say risk involved. But in the moment we said yes, He gave to us the Holy Spirit. And that's the assurance to us that He's really serious about it. And so He's in the far place preparing a, a house for us, a a place for us to live. And that's, that was the custom of that time. Um, when a young man made a proposal, he would take the, those something of value to give to her and her family to say, listen, this is not fly by night. This is the real deal. I love her. I want to marry her. But I got to go get a place ready. Will you be content to wait? Yes, I'll wait. And so he goes and he prepares a place. And uh, it's been a long time. Is he ever going to come back? And then she looks down at the golden bangles and the golden earrings. And she says, oh, he's coming back, or you'd be fool not, you know, not to. And when she looks, it gives her comfort that he's coming back. Now, that's, that's the idea that we have here, that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. It's the down payment. Now, I said a moment ago, the inheritance, or last week, the inheritance is something we get now, but we don't enjoy it till later on. And, and primarily, that's true. Now, we get a little glimpse, a foretaste of glory in the person of the Holy Spirit and the relationship we can have to the Holy Spirit right here, right now. We're to live in Him and walk in Him and enjoy Him. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And that starts right here, right now. We can love God. We can know God. We can enjoy God right here, right now. We can have peace in our hearts when the world's falling to bits because we've got a promise and we've got an assurance and we've got an earnest. We look at the bangles and say, there's more where that came from. And really and truly, the best is yet to come. And that's what he's saying. I've left you the Holy Spirit to guarantee to you that I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to pick you up. See, the price has already been paid. That's not the deal. It's us. And there's been a big um, uh, notice slapped on my chest. Sold. Coming up to pick him up later on. <laughs> I'm bought and paid for by Jesus. And he, he just uh, didn't have enough room in the car to take me now. He's coming back to get me. That's the idea. And he is. He's coming to get. And that's the redemption of our body. That's the rapture. And he could come at any moment. And boy, do we ever look for that. So it means the indwelling by God. It means uh, to have an earnest from God. And lastly, it means to be marked for God. Now, when you think of things being sealed, you might think of, you know, we don't really do a lot of sealing really in our day, but you might think of sealing an envelope. Um, when Leslie used to send me Valentine cards, used to, she still does. In fact, she still does this. I think after the last one I got, there's on the back of it, it says, this is when I embarrass my wife, <laughs> S-W-A-L-K, Swalk. <laughs> what does Swalk mean? Sealed with a loving kiss. Now, in those days, they would actually have, you know, uh, wax where they would burn a, the wax onto, the, onto the, the lip of that seal. Or if it was a scroll, they would take the lip and they would, they would, you know, the scroll that Jesus opens in the book of the Revelation has seven seals upon it. Now, if a letter is sealed, it basically means this. There's nothing more to be written, is there? And once you have written the letter and you've signed your name and you seal the letter, there's only one thing left. Signed, sealed, and delivered. So once something is sealed, there's nothing more to be done to it. It's ready to go in the mailbox. The only thing's left is to get delivered. But the letter itself is complete. It's a done deal. And your salvation is complete. It's a done deal. You are sealed in the sense that whatever God has done in you and for you to acquire your salvation has been completed. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished, it is completed. There's nothing else to be added to it. Not your works, not your faithfulness, not your baptism, nothing. When you believe upon Christ in that moment, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And the only thing left is for him to pick you up. Because of Christ's completed work in you, you belong to him. One of the things that happens when they used to seal the letters, they would take a signet ring that maybe would have the, the coat of arms or maybe it was the uh, initials of the person and they would put that ring into the hot wax and therefore identifying who, belong, who it belonged to. You see, sealing indicates who you belong to. 
Um, look at Second Timothy chapter 2. Look at that clock again. I love this clock. It's only 20 to 7. <laughs> gonna, that happened this morning. It was 10, it was 10 past 12, I thought, and the clock said like 20 minutes to 12. I thought, this is brilliant. Out of all times, of all kinds of time. No. I preached for, I think, an hour and five minutes or something. Look at second, we're almost finished. Look at Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 19. Sealing has to do with identification. Sealing has to do with a, a being marked for God. In Second Timothy 2 and verse number 19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. God knows who you belong to. And one of the reasons he knows who you belong to is because you've been sealed. He set his mark upon you. Now, um, look at Revelation for just a moment. And then we're nearly finished. But look at Revelation chapter, look at uh, chapter 7, first of all. Do you know the, 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 the 666? What's that called? It's the mark of the beast. Do you know what that is? That's a seal. You know why the Bible says if you take that, that mark that you're condemned, you're as far as, as far as God's concerned, it's, it's signed, sealed, and delivered. You're on your way to eternal flames when they take that mark of the beast upon them because they have just taken the mark of Satan upon them. But you know also that God's servants had a mark as well. Uh, look at uh, Revelation 7 and verse number 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. In the first three and a half years, there's going to be 144,000 Jewish witnesses, 12,000 from each tribe. And the Bible says that they will be sealed. Um, in another place, it says they have the seal of God on their forehead. And what it means is that they belong to God. They're marked by God. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 as, as we close. It means that we are marked for God. Once you get his mark on you, that's it. Just as the, the unbeliever takes the mark of the Antichrist, that's it. There's no turning back from that. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, not all the unsaved have re received that mark, but many of them do. Um, so what it means is uh, what we find here in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the, the day of redemption. Now, here, here's the point I want to bring home to us as we close tonight. Do you see in verse 30 there? He tells you how your sin and my sin grieve the Holy Spirit. But we cannot lose the Holy Spirit. See that? He says, grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed under the day of redemption. He says, look, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is not leaving you, because you are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is with you, he shall be in you, and he will abide with you forever. He's not ever coming out of you. In the rapture, he's still in you. In the millennial kingdom, he's still in you. Throughout all eternity, the Holy Spirit will be in us. Now, here's, here's the point I want to bring to us. If you are truly saved by trusting Christ alone for your salvation, how could it ever be reversed? If the price has been paid and you're redeemed, how does God come back and on? How does he reverse that? How can God not pay the price that has already been paid for you? If you've already been stamped and declared to be redeemed, how can God reverse that? Can I tell you, he cannot. Based upon the, the payment of his son, it is irreversible. If you have already been forgiven all sins, uh, that your sins have been taken and removed from you as far as the east is from the west, they've been buried in the depth of the deepest sea, cast behind God's back, how in the world can those sins be brought back to you? Can I tell you? They cannot. When you have been forgiven all sins, it means there's nothing more to be forgiven. That is your position in Christ. That is your salvation. It's something you cannot lose. You can grieve God. You can hurt God. You can mess your life up. You'll receive the chastening of God where God will take you home early. But you cannot lose that which God has done in your heart. If you have already been accepted in the beloved, how can you be unaccepted in the beloved? You didn't do anything to get accepted in the first place. It was the grace of God. And so how can our sin reverse that? It cannot. If you have already been predestinated to a future, wonderful future, 
You have already been chosen to stand before him blameless, if we've been predestinated to this wonderful inheritance that we're already seated, the Bible says in chapter 2, in heavenly places, we're already there. How can it be reversed? My friend, it cannot. And if you have been sealed and marked, and the down payment has been made, how can God reverse those blessings? How can you lose it? You can't. Well, is that reason then to go out and say, well, I can just live any old way I want? You know, to be honest with you, I don't really know any Christians that have that spur. We talk about that all the time. I don't think I've really... And maybe you have met some. The ones that I believe uh, have that spur of, of carelessness, they don't have assurance of salvation. Did you know that? They don't have assurance of salvation. But the ones who believe this stuff and say, you know something, I'm... S- <laughs> Sign, sealed, and about to be delivered. I am secure in Christ. I know that I am. I know that I have eternal life. I know that I have a, that inheritance in Christ. I am so happy about it. I'm safe and secure in Him. Do you know what it does? It makes us love Him. It makes us say, fantastic, let's do something for God. That's what I see. And friend, that's the way it's supposed to be. Don't be afraid of the doctrine of eternal security. When they say, well, that's just an excuse. You live any way you No, it is not. No, it isn't. It provides the security and the motivation and the love to love him back. You know what the greatest commandment is? Is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. It's to love God. Let me ask you something. Do you love God? When was the last time you told God you loved him? You ever just walked down the road and said, Lord, I love you? See all this business about your, your coming again? I can't wait. You know why I'm so excited about it? Oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. I want to see him. Because I love him. I want to see Israel receive him. Because I love him and I love them. And I love them because he loves them. The greatest commandment, the first commandment, the most important commandment is to love God. Why do you love God? Because when I read in this book, he has blessed me with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus God has loved me. He has proved his love for me. He's done for me. He's, he has undertaken for me. He has saved me. He has redeemed me. He has cleansed me. He has forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. The wonderful, marvelous, matchless, unsearchable riches of his grace. That's why I love him. And the more you look into that and the more you find out how much he's done for you and the more you find out how much you love him or he loves you, you'll not be able to help yourself. You'll want to talk to him. When you've got a choice, a, a fork in the road where one way is going to lead you away from God and shame the Lord and shame you and hurt God, my friend, when you're loving God, you're going to say, no, rip the heart out of me to do that. No. I want to do right. Why? Because I love God. I want to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. It's a love relationship with him. And enjoy God, enjoy God. He is to be enjoyed. Don't rob yourself of these blessings by denying any of these truths, because they are true. And he's written them that we might know the things that we have from him. Let's bow together for prayer. Father, thank you for your wonderful love. Thank you so for so great salvation. Forgiven as your best and your son. Lord, you do all things well. And everything you do is wonderful. And sometimes, Lord, we just skip over, we get used to it, it becomes commonplace to us. But Lord, if we just stop and for a minute and really look hard and look at what you've done for us, it's absolutely amazing. Grace is amazing. It's amazing grace. We should be astounded. We should be overjoyed. This should never become old hat for us. This is something that should just delight our hearts every day. We are rich in Christ. Lord, I pray that you'll encourage every believer here tonight. Maybe someone, Lord, who's not been really secure in that salvation. Lord, may they grab a hold of it tonight. It's theirs for the taking. You've told us what you've done. Help us to believe it. And then if for someone, Lord, who's never... Truly just let go of all this other stuff and just trust it, Jesus, and therefore receiving that assurance. Lord, help them to do that right now. Right now. And Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.